Let's begin with this image. Uh, here is a painting by a guy called John Hall, uh, no relation, um, who's um, based in Edinburgh, uh, part of an organisation called Orwell Arts, which is a group of people with learning disabilities and, uh, and other artists um, uh, with, whom I've, with whom I've collaborated on a number of, of research projects. Um, the painting was, was part of an, an exhibition of their work in a uh, mainstream art space in 2009 and was, um, along with the majority of the, the, all the other paintings, was, was snapped up for a pretty uh, large sum at the end of the exhibition. The reason I put the painting up at the start here is that I think, it's, I think it's, um, it, it, it really illustrates a number of, of the themes I want to, to speak to today. The, the, the first is that, is that if you re re remove the writing <laughs> on the front there, um, it, it really displays the skills and, the skills and, uh, the skills and abilities of, of a person um, who is seen by many in mainstream society as someone without competence and ability. So I think that's, that's extremely important. The second thing is that it, it shows a different way of communicating uh, ideas, emotions and experiences. Um, and thirdly, it reflects this increasing um, um, expectation to be heard, to have your voice heard, to be empowered uh, and to have self-confidence, which exists uh, um, uh, amongst an amongst amongst an increasing number of people with learning disabilities and uh, um, disabled people more broadly. Okay. And these three issues uh, became very important in the research I did with Orwell Arts and I want to reflect on, on some of those as part of the presentation. Okay. As you're all aware, there's been a troubled history of social research and disability. There's the, the, the title of the book that's just been referred to by James Charlton, Nothing about us without us, but also other writers like Colin Barnes and Mike Oliver, who a lot of you will be aware of, have written, wrote papers in the early 90s, uh, very much challenging uh, um, the, the dynamics, the social relations of research. So this, this, these two uh, authors were, were part of a broader um, disability political movement, and uh, they really questioned the usefulness um, of social research and disability uh, actually indeed going further to really to claim that much research was actively oppressing disabled people. And Mike Oliver in his uh, paper asked the question, do researchers wish to continue to use their skills and expertise in ways which disabled people find oppressive? Uh, uh, and he, um, he describes research of the 70s and 80s as a process of alienation. Um, or, to quote, do researchers wish to wish to join with disabled people and use their expertise and skills in their s s struggles uh, against oppression. So both Oliver and Barnes advocated instead an emancipatory model um, approach to research, which was really closely allied with the disabled people's movement. Okay. And I said the title uh, of that book really illustrated uh, the argument they, that they were making. But this, it was this connection between research and overall political process, which was uh, the, the, the point they were stressing. Okay. Again, as you all know, um, the, the, um, both the disability political movement and, and disabled academics really drawing on, on theories, of, theories of historical materialism uh, campaigned long and hard to transform the conceptual and later on the, the, the popular understanding of disability from the so-called medical model, focused on individuals and their impair impairments, to really much to a social model which loc located disability in, these, in the oppressive social context and relations and structures. And just to use, just to use, to use geography um, as an example, I'm a geographer, um, like most, um, most social research, really, geog really geographical research on, on disability in the 1970s, really to the early 1990s, identified disability as an individual medically defined uh, problem to be described and mapped. Okay, so some examples of that from the work, for example, first of Jonathan Mayer and uh, also of Rich Gollidge. Very important work, very very well done work, but very much from from this from this 
particular perspective. Um, but from this research on disabled people, there was a move very much influenced by the work of Oliver and Barnes in the early 90s uh, to thinking about doing research for disabled people, i.e. taking up though very much the lessons of, of the social model and thinking uh, about, about disability from that perspective. Um, so this is um, drawing on the work of Brendan or Brendan Gleeson and Ruth Butler and Sophie Bowlby, who, um, although they weren't doing work with disabled people, were very much concerned about the, uh, seeing this from a social model uh, perspective. Okay. And more recently, there's been a shift to uh, an, um, away from um, on uh, to uh, uh, for and on to with. Um, um, and this is very much, a, very much a positive development. And I would say that this change has been really been driven by those three factors that I identified right at the start of the right at the start of the talk about uh, the increased self confidence of uh, disabled people, about the desire to be heard, about the different recognition of the different ways of communicating. So some further examples from geography here will be the work of Han Mc. Hannah McPherson, University of Brighton, um, who did a, a fantastic piece of work uh, about visually impaired walking groups, where she acted um, as a um, acted as a sighted guide um, in a, uh, a participatory piece of, of, of work. And what was what was what was most important about this is that she allowed herself to be guided. I mean, ironically, I suppose allowed it, allowed her, the, the research to be to actually be actually be guided by the, the people who she was working with, and also a piece of work uh, by Andy Power and Ruth Bartley, which I'll return to a bit later. Um, but they're, they're, the piece of work they did about welcoming communities, um, which involved collaboration throughout the research uh, with the data gathered by a small number of people with, with learning disabilities and then disseminated um, at a public event. So these examples uh, reflect a further shift uh, not only in research practice, but also in the theori theorization of disability. These things obviously are very much connected from, from really from the social model to now, I, I would argue, to uh, a model or an understanding which, in, in, uh, which, is, in, which is embodied, which is contextual, contingent, and, and relational. I'll go on to explain a bit more um, uh, about that as I go along. But really just to focus on that last term, the relational uh, term there uh, at the end. So as I said, there's been, there's been this development of a contextual relational model of disability. Um, and to quote uh, a recent piece of work um, on this that I've, that I've done, thinking about disability as a product of ongoing dynamic interactions between complex embodied experiences and emotions and specific contexts, I'm a geographer, and sets of relations. And if you think about that, if you think about this relationship between context, this has just been mentioned, and, and, and research, then I, it helps us to think about the relations of research. Um, if we think about, think about disability as relational, it helps us think about the relations of the research in a, in a more informed way. As I've already said right at the start of the talk, the relations of research um, in, with disability have been characterized by the disability movement as both exploitative and perpetuating, uh, perpetuating de dependency. And this move to a more emancipatory model um, in, in, in the, um, the early 90s. And this desire from the disability movement for researchers to be facilitators. Um, not quite collaborators, more facilitators. That's very much the 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 the, um, the Barnes model. And returning to that quote I gave you at the start uh, about Mike Oliver, that researchers need to work alongside disabled people to realise their realise their goals. Okay. So. Um, so to shift those relations of research from exploitation to emancipation, uh, which can possibly transform people's lives. Um, for academics, researchers, this was and remains a hugely challenging thing to do, of course. There's been a more recent uh, shift, as has been mentioned yesterday and um, will be talked about uh, this afternoon as well, uh, to uh, an approach, um, as we all know, uh, uh, of co-production uh, with, and going back to Graham's uh, slide, um, um, uh, sorry, Graham, 
Jamie's slide at the start there, um, shifting from uh, with to by uh, research. I think there's a tension potentially there in co-production research. Uh, we often say um, with, um, then we try and do by. By is very hard. By has all sort of all sort of consequences as well. So it's it's not an easy uh, easy process. What this and there's some, a, a few quotes here from De Rose et al. Um, on co-productive research that aims to put principles of empowerment into practice, working with groups and communities offering greater control over the research. It's enhanced, including experiential, experiential expertise, which may highlight relevant questions otherwise neglected by experts. So again, identifying the, you know, the particular research problems from, from their perspective. And co-production can enhance the effectiveness of research by making it better informed by groups and communities' preferences and needs, with communities then contributing to improve outcomes and achievable, achievable solutions. Um, so the, 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 the key switch here um, is that what you're doing is you're trying to shift the control of the research process. It's about the, identif the, the identification of the research questions and it's about addressing those key problems and working out possible solutions. So, reflecting back on where I where I started in this in this tale, um, we see here the purpose, the objective for disabled people uh, to be agents of research, assessing the agenda, perhaps doing the research, although there are issues about that, which I'll come back to, analysing the research, feeding that back, but also being the beneficiaries of the research as well. And those two things, of course, are related. OK, I just wanted to give some examples now uh, um, of this work from um, my own research, but also from, from, from other people. Okay. Going back to the, the work that of um, Andrew Power and Ruth, Ruth Bartlett, um, the title of the research is, is, is this, and I, I, the, the, opening, the opening quote was used by one of the people they work with. I used to be quiet, now people can't stop me from talking, which connects back to this idea of giving people a voice, people having increasing self-confidence, and also, also hints at the importance of the process of research as well. Okay? It's not simply about the outputs, it's about the, the process that people experience through taking part in research. This was a piece of work which was, which was a collaboration with an advocacy group called Choices Advocacy in, 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 uh, in Southampton. Um, so this idea came from the academics going to this advocacy group and saying, this is our idea, do you want to take part? And from there, the project was developed. Um, the context of this happening um, context is very important for research, is that there were changes to services happening at that time, in particular the closure of day centres in Southampton, the shift to a personalisation model, and people were very concerned about where they were going to meet their friends, where they were going to receive the support that they required. Okay. So, that, so that really drove the project, was that concern about, the, the, about changes in services, about things happening. What they did, therefore, focusing on, on spaces and spaces and places, was to, in agreement, it came up with this idea collectively, was to use the approach of photo diaries, giving people cameras, and it's a, a technique that's been used a lot, but still very effective, to go to places that they felt, uh, and sorry, to take photographs of the places that, of, of importance to, to them over a, a one month period. And this came up with a range of, of places from homes, as you, as you might expect, but also to allotments, to, to car, inside of cars, to, uh, to the library, to, uh, to a coffee shop, to a particular, particular street or whatever. So it was a, it was, um, a way to, for people to express themselves um, at, at with a sort of a, a conventional interview format. And then, and then focus groups were used um, not only in the planning of the research, but then also to, to, to reflect on the findings. Okay. One of the important points I want to make here, though, and this is abs absolutely crucial, is that the role of advocates in this. Okay. And these advocates who were working with the, with the people with disabilities in this group, were, some of those advocates were, were disabled people themselves, but others weren't, and just want to make the point that in relation to disability, 
when you're engaging with um, people who are often excluded from the research process, you're not just engaging with them, you're engaging with the, with the networks of which they are part. Hence this emphasis, emphasis on the relational understanding of disability. It's not just about the individual, it's about families, it's about supporters, it's about advocates, it's about places and a whole range of, of, of relationships and networks of which they are part. Okay, so you're not just, participation isn't just about a collection of individuals. Well, that's, that's the point I want to make, uh, make there. Okay. And then there was an exhibition feedback event which I, I actually took part in uh, in Southampton in October, which attracted a range of, of people from the local, um, the local authority, uh, social care services, the people who had closed down the research, uh, the, 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 um, the centres and, and support services that really people valued so much. They came along and they, they heard the story. And it was very, it was very, um, very powerful uh, uh, event. And, and I'm unsure of its, its ultimate impact. Um, I'll have to, to speak to the authors and find that out. Okay, and, that, and that's just the advocacy group that they, that they, they work with. Okay. Another example um, from, uh, from, from some colleagues at the University of Dundee, uh, Anna Lou Waller and Tilo Kroll, a uh, piece of research, um, a little bit different, providing access to life stories for adults with communication and language impairment. This talk is very much about giving voice, uh, and obviously for people with communication impairments, uh, then this is even more, um, or even more of a challenge. There are 365,000 people in the UK uh, who could benefit from some form of alternative or augmented communication. So when we, when we talk about participation, we kind of expect people to be able to talk, be able to have a voice, and if that isn't the case, um, or we find it hard to communicate, then obviously we need to think of different methods to uh, enable that to happen. What's really interesting is that this was a bit of a, uh, a this is a project which which um, challenged uh, a lot of those enabling technologies really from the social model perspective. The idea is if you if you change the 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 the, um, the, the context within which people are, then then hopefully that they'll be able to uh, um, uh, take part. But um, a lot of the technology focus at the present time focuses solely on needs. Uh, uh, people have, for example, I am thirsty, uh, and doesn't allow for people to, to have conversations, chats, and take part in dialogue, which obviously restricts uh, the, the communication that they can have, the participation that they are able to, to, uh, to have. So what the project did was work with these adults with severe speech uh, impairments, but also, as I said, work with their support staff, their families, and their friends, and help them to find ways to formulate uh, their, um, their words so that they could take part um, in these conversations. And then, as part of this, was to train uh, those adults and their, and their various um, others who, who were connected to them uh, to be able to share these, uh, to share these stories. So um, a project with real impact, because one of the outcomes was some software to uh, enable people to share their um, experiences, which obviously is a key part um, of participation. And then this went on to uh, a presentation, a workshop on these research findings, which involved uh, the people using their new technology uh, um, with 400 members of the public um, in um, the centre of town. OK, final pair of examples, um, aware of the time. Um, some of my own uh, work, um, a, um, in the SSC seminar series that I did with colleagues at Glasgow and Dundee. Um, there were three work, three seminars, an academic seminar, uh, a seminar with people with learning disabilities and a seminar with policy makers and practitioners, though, although importantly there were people with learning disabilities present at, at all three um, of the, the workshops and took part in the debates and the discussions uh, um, that, that were there on the day. Um, the, important, the bit I want to focus on, though, is the, work, the, the workshop um, that uh, formed Seminar 2, and this involved um, key issues which were defined by a theatre company, Inform Theatre, at the Dundee Rec Theatre there, um, in the city, um, and I worked with them. I worked with the, act the other actors who work, work, 
worked with him to devise a series of sketches, uh, a series of, of short pieces of theatre, which then uh, led to uh, debate and discussion within the room. So that was a great way um, of me working with them, but also this then fed back into not only that seminar, but also then into the seminar with the policymakers and, and the practitioners um, and had real impact on them. Um, on the day. And a piece of work which uh, Andy Power and uh, I hope to begin this year, if we get the funding, um, is very much going to be a participatory project where we are going to uh, engage with uh, a small number of people with disabilities to train them up to be researchers for all stages of the projects uh, from identifying the questions to dissemination, although there are key challenges um, involved with that, um, of course. Okay, just another couple of things to say and then I'll, I'll stop. This is just some images from the um, Informed Theatre in Dundee who took part in that, um, in that event. They were a great gang. Okay. So, to make co-productive uh, research um, happen, I would argue you need a number of things um, in place. Um, it's thinking about the research process as a whole, really de deconstructing that from, uh, from start to finish, and it takes time. It takes time to do this, as has already been mentioned. Allow for the research problem to be redefined. Um, you may have an idea, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As Graham was saying, you don't just want to go along to people and say, well, what do you want to do research on? People want you to come with a problem, but they want an opportunity to influence that as well. Employed a range of methods, perhaps it's creative arts, maybe it's photo diaries, but you have to use a range of methods for people to be able to give their voice. Um, Understanding in relation to disability, excuse me, um, is that disability is contextual, where and where, where and when research takes place and where people are actually makes a difference to their participation in, in the research and the outputs, and also recognise disability as relational, you have to uh, engage with um, all these other people and players and actors. And also, the research is a process. Uh, and that's my experience is uh, that it's um, um, it, the people learn and gain so much from the process, not simply from the outcomes. Uh, um, and so we shouldn't just be focused on outputs all the time, which can happen. Just, 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 to, just to round off, um, a few limitations and challenges. The research process, research relation is always going to be unequal um, but, um, for a whole range of obvious ways. Um, Perhaps problem in research can mean that we don't tackle some of these harder questions. If people are within a particular discourse, how do we encourage them to break out and think about things in different ways? Um, although you could argue that it was the disability political movement that changed theorization of disability, so maybe I'm, that's completely a poor point to make. Um, again, processes, research is a process. They don't promise too much in terms of outcomes. The promise can be in the experience as well. Um, and how do you rec maintain the, the, the representation of others? And also, are you exploiting people when you use them for research? So, to conclude, a quote here from Chris Cregan, uh, Director of the Scottish Institute of Learning Disability. We need to create spaces for dialogue, negotiation and creativity. And I think as researchers we have a, a fantastic role we can play in allowing people the space and time, organisations and, and individuals to think about uh, policy and practice. Okay. Research should be about us, with us, um, and we need to think about uh, the research process and relations to research um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense. The voice of disabled people can be increasingly heard, and I think we, we, there's no escaping that, and we have to embrace uh, their in increasing confidence. But there are four issues, just to wrap up, um, where we need to keep thinking about, I'm sure this will come up later, this comes from De Rose et al again, about our, our presence and the presence of others, how authentic are the voices that we're hearing, are, are they representatives, and at the core of this, what are uh, the ongoing challenges of the relations of research.